The following program is made possible by the friends and partners of Daniel Fusco Ministries. Hey everybody, my name is Daniel Fusco and welcome to today's Real Show. So it's Mother's Day. Let's be honest, all moms are hugely influential in our lives. I think about my mom. My mother passed away when I was about 21 years old, but there hasn't been a day in my entire life that the influence of my mom hasn't been felt. I can still hear my mom's ideas, her counsel and her wisdom in my mind and heart as I make decisions as an adult, as a parent, within my marriage, and I'm absolutely grateful for my mom's influence on my life. Now I realize that not everybody had an amazing mom the way that I did, but all of us have had moms and mothers are gonna continue to be influential in our lives long after we're being raised in their home. And so we wanna see today, what does it mean to be a mom? And how do we move through life in relationship to moms? By looking at perhaps the most famous mother in history. Now, I know that there's some of you right now who you're really fascinated by this topic, but you're saying to yourself, I don't think I've ever watched a show like Real Before. I hear that from people just like you all the time. I just wanna encourage you to join me on this journey because Whatever the situation you had with your mom was or is, God wants to do an amazing work in and through all of this in our lives. So you ready? Join me. Let's get real on today's program. On behalf of myself and the entire Crossroads team, I want to wish each one of you a very happy and a very blessed Mother's Day. I realize that Mother's Day is a, it's one of those days that are, can be consumed with a lot of different emotions. We realize that not everybody is in a happy mom kind of a place. And so for Mother's Day, what I want to do today is I want to look at the, um, maybe the most famous mom in the Bible. I want to a message that I'm calling the Mary model. As I look at Mary as a, the Mary model, I, I don't want you to think for one second, well, this is a message for ladies because we're gonna see everything that Mary models is something that all of us as believers want to model in our own lives. So open up in your Bibles to the book of Luke chapter one. Luke chapter one, I'm gonna be picking up in verse 26. I'm gonna be going all the way into chapter two, kind of picking out different parts of the life of Mary, the mother of Jesus. So picking up in Luke chapter 1, verse 26, it begins this way. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, The virgin's name was Mary, and having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus, and he will be great and will be called the son of the highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. So we begin first that Mary is a beautiful model of grace. She's a model of grace. Now you'd be like, well, where did you get that from? So what you find, especially in the King James Bible in verse 28, rejoice, highly favored one. It actually says in the King James, hail Mary, or hello Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. If you go down a couple more verses where it says, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, same word. So we have this idea that Mary, the mother of Jesus, is a tremendous model of grace. She's full of grace. Now, here's the deal. If you are here today and you have put your faith and trust in Jesus already, then you are full of grace because grace has been bestowed upon you because of who Jesus is. That's the good news. The good news is that God wants to fill up each one of our lives with his favor, with his grace. And the Christian life is truly a life about grace. Now, I realize that for some of you, when you hear this idea that it's about grace, we have all these ideas of what grace is. 
Like when I, I remember before I came to start reading the Bible, the idea of grace is literally someone being graceful, like a ballerina who can move kind of almost effortlessly uh, uh, through a dance with, with this poise and this, and this togetherness. And so I used to think that's, that that was what grace was. But when I started reading the Bible, I realized that grace is a reality that we get to experience because Jesus is real. Grace is a state of being where which you realize that you have found favor with God and the favor of God becomes a part of your life and works through your life into the world. But when was the last time, for those of you here who are followers of Jesus, that you thought of yourself as being favored? When was the last time you thought about yourself as being full of grace? That your life is completely full of God's grace. This reminds me of Ephesians chapter four, verse seven. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. To each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of the gift of Jesus. Mary's a phenomenal model of grace because She's full of grace. Now, we get the stories, the details here of of the birth of Jesus. It's in the sixth month that we're going to see. It was the sixth month after the announcement of the pregnancy of the mother of John the Baptist, right? And the angel Gabriel heads to this region called Galilee, a city named Nazareth, to a virgin who's Mary, betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph. And if you recall that idea of being betrothed is that they were legally married, but their marriage had not been consummated. Mary was a virgin, and she was legally betrothed to this man named Joseph. And then all of a sudden, this angel shows up, this angel Gabriel, and says, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you amongst women. Now, think about that for a second. I mean, that's kind of a pretty serious thing to say, isn't it? But if you're full of grace, then you are blessed amongst people. But the angel Gabriel tells her, that you're going to bring forth a son. His name's going to be Jesus, and he's going to occupy the throne of David. Now, continuing on in verse 34 of Luke 1, it says this, Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I don't know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month for her who is called barren. For with God nothing will be impossible. And then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord... Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Now, from there, what we learn is that Mary is a model of faith, of purity, and of submission. These three things. Mary is a model of faith, of purity, and of submission. Now, again, just as all of us, if we're in Christ, are full of grace, now these three adjectives that I give to you for Mary are all things that we want to see as part of our lives. Now, I get this idea that Mary is a model of faith because after she hears all these things, she says in verse 38, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. Now, we find that Mary is a model of purity because she has been set apart for God. She's never known a man. So when she hears that she's going to have a baby, she's like, uh, hello. Um, She didn't say hello. That's my my inflection into this thing. But but it's like, you know, hey, listen, so there's a couple things that need to go on before that's possible. None of those things have gone on. Let the hearer understand. She can read between the lines of what I'm saying here. And she's a model of purity. She's been set apart for the Lord. And then the Lord's like, well, listen, this is, you know, the angel's like, well, what's going to happen? The Holy Spirit's going to overshadow you. And, 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 and then you're going to have a baby. She's like, oh, okay. Now, that's what I call faith. Because does it make any sense? Because, because what's going on here? It's like for her, this whole thing, she's like, well, okay. I'm your servant, Lord. And, and that's what faith is. See, faith says, even though it makes no sense, even though I can't fathom how this is going to work, I'm just going to step on out and say, okay. 
And, and all through your Bible, you have these examples of these folks who take these radical steps of faith that make no sense. Like you think of Gideon with his 300 going against the Midianite army. It makes no sense. But when God's in the middle of it, guess what? It makes total sense. So Mary's a tremendous model of faith. Like, this has never happened before, but now it's happening. Oh, okay, it's going to happen to me. And in some ways, I think that when God intervenes in our lives, we want to kind of have this, this faith. This faith that believes that the God of the all possible might want to prove that to other people through our lives. So Mary's a tremendous model of faith, and she's a model of purity, but she's also a model of submission to the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. See, Mary is not saying, I got my agenda, God, and I need you to get on board with it. She's saying, Lord, that's your agenda, then let's do that. My life is yours. And it reminds me of James chapter 4, verse 7 on this idea of submission. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Submit to God. See, submission is the reality that God is God and I am not. That God is all-knowing and I don't know a whole lot about a lot of things. That God has a perfect plan for me and everyone around me and this world that we live in. And I don't really know what that is, but I want to be a part of God's plan. And I think for all of us, don't we struggle with submitting? I mean, the Bible says, submit to one another. That's Ephesians 5.22. In the love of Christ. It says, we, should, we submit to God, and then we submit to one another, and then it goes on, and wives to your own husbands. But oftentimes, like, people freak out about, you know, like, oh, I can't, I can't believe the Bible, because as wives submit to your husbands, well, actually, the verse before says, submit to one another, so it's no fun for anybody, I guess. But what that all means is that there is a reality that when you begin to think, and this is a cultural dilemma that our culture has, that we begin to think it's all about me. Guess what? It isn't all about you. We're all dependent, infinitely dependent on one another. And so Mary becomes this beautiful picture of I am here and I am yours. Do whatever you want. And we want to learn from that model, a model of faith, God who can do anything, a model of purity. She's set apart for the Lord. Then if we scroll down just a little bit to verse 46, what you find is that Mary goes to visit Elizabeth. I'm going to talk about that in a second, right? And then we have this beautiful thing called the Magnificat or the, the Song of Mary. It says in verse 46 of Luke 1, and Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior, for he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant, for behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name, and his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation." He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. My friends, Mary is a beautiful model of worship here. I mean, Mary's worship song, the song of Mary, the Magnificat, is recorded in Scripture and is read and prayed and rejoiced upon all the time. That's why the Magnificat, my soul magnifies the Lord. That's where you get that, that classic phrase, the Magnificat. That's what they call this. See, in all that's going on, in all the busyness of this woman's life, and all the things that's happening, she's now with child. She goes to see her, her family member, Elizabeth, who's with child, and she is a model of worship. See, you and I were created by God to worship. I actually believe that every problem that you have as an individual is a worship problem. That word worship, it literally means, it comes from the word worth, what we declare the worth of or the value of. And what goes on is we live in a day and age where everything is jockeying for that position of worth 
and value in our hearts. And the Bible teaches unequivocally that God is meant to be the object of your worship. And then because you worship God, then everything else falls into its right place. But if you do not allow God to be the object of your worship, everything in your life becomes off kilter. And when I think of Mother's Day, for so many women, the valuation that you discern from your husband and from your kids is really how you derive your self-worth. And that will leave you off kilter because you're deriving your worth from people who are broken. But Jesus wants to be the driver of how you evaluate yourself. And when you worship God, when you place God at the center, then even if you've got a, a husband who isn't perfect, and, and none of us are, even if your husband's horrible, even if your kids are the worst, but you worship God, because of your placing the worth on God, God shows you who you truly are. Now, I'm just doing that. If I could say the same thing on Father's Day, and I could use a different set of variables for guys. I like to say that we're created to live lifestyles of worship. That when we wake up and we go to bed, when we gather together as a church and when we're just moving through life, we find ourselves declaring the worth of God in everything that we do. It reminds me of Psalm 96, verses 1 to 4. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless his name. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory amongst the nations his wonders among all peoples, for the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. But if you're exploring Jesus, at this point, a lot of people stumble because they say, well, why would I want to believe in a God who needs me to declare his worth? Doesn't that mean that God is insecure? And that's a really interesting question. And this is what I would say. God is glorious whether we acknowledge it or not. God is not deficient, therefore he needs worship. Truth is a virtue in God's economy. And we need to worship God because that is what's true and right and real. So if you choose not to worship God, God isn't lacking because of you. you don't worship, but you're lacking because you're not living into the reality of who he is. Does that make sense? So God isn't deficient if you don't worship. God is already all sufficient, but you lack. And because when you don't worship and you now have holes and everything's off kilter, then you can't be the vehicle of God's grace and love and mercy and all these things in the world until this thing is right. And so God is jealous for you with the, the, the jealousy of a mom who loves her children. If we scroll down a little bit more, look at Luke chapter 1, verse 56. After this beautiful song of Mary, the Magnificat, it says, and Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her house. Now, we find out that Mary's cousin Elizabeth is pregnant, and she's pregnant in her old age. She had been barren for a long time. So Mary finds out that she's pregnant, and she goes to Elizabeth, and that kind of is what happens, and that's what kind of precedes this beautiful worship song of Mary. But now we find out that Mary returned or remained with her for three months and returned to her house. And so now what you find is that Mary's pregnant, but she's serving and caring for her pregnant older cousin Elizabeth. What does this teach us? Mary's a model of self-sacrificial service, which every single mom can identify a model of self-sacrificial service. That's what Mary is. I mean, you can imagine Mary's like, look, I'm not, I'm married, but I'm not, we haven't consummated, now I'm pregnant, and the Messiah's in my belly. I might need a spa day, All right? Like I, like, I might need to, like, you know, my ankles are swelling, I'm tired, you know, like, like I, I, you know, I, I got, I got you know, the first trimester is kind of messy. All this stuff's going on. You know, I can't, but what's she doing? She's serving her cousin. And not just like a little bit, like I go visit her and I, and I, and I clean up a little bit. She lived there for three months. Now, Elizabeth was six months pregnant. So what was Mary doing? Mary was there for the entire third trimester, right? In the midst of her pregnancy. And this reminds me, of course, of Galatians chapter five, verse 13, 
where it says, by love, serve one another. By love, serve one another. Jesus said the greatest in the kingdom is the servant of all. We're all called to serve self-sacrificially. And that's one of the big steps that we all take, isn't it? When we learn how to serve even when it's not convenient. Because I think what we have going on with the idea of service is we feel like it's, well, if it's convenient, but what you realize is that it's never convenient to give of yourself. But when we respond to Jesus and when we follow Jesus, we begin to realize that self-sacrifice is the way of God's kingdom. You think of the cross. Mary's a tremendous model here of self-sacrificial service. Now, I have one more way that I want to show you that Mary is a model. As you move into Luke chapter 2, you find that Jesus is born, and then you find all the declarations of who this child is. And then when you get to verse 19, it says this. It says, but Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told to them. And so what goes on is these shepherds show up and they, they tell all these things, how they saw these hosts of angels and glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And then we hear this phrase that Mary kept all these things and she pondered them in her heart. And so as we close out this Mother's Day message, Mary is a great model of a quiet heart. Because all these things are going on and Mary is taking them and she's, she's pondering them in her heart. And, and, the, and we see this over and over and over again in the life of Mary where something will go on and it says, and Mary kept these things in her heart. She pondered them in her heart. And God calls all of us to keep a quiet heart before him. And I think the art of a quiet heart is a lost practice in a culture like ours. Because everything is so, like, you know, reactive. You know what I mean? Something goes on and everyone's yelling. You know what I mean? It's like you, you, read, you read a comment online and you're, like, tearing in. You're writing an opus, shredding someone you never met who's writing under an assumed name, arguing about some article, right? And that's the world we live in where there's, there's almost no, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna dwell on this. And I'm going to allow this thing to, to just sit for a second. But Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 3, says this. Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they, without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear and listen to this, don't let your adornment be merely outward, the arranging of the hair, the wearing gold, the putting on a fine of apparel, but rather let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. You know, and, and when, when I read in Luke chapter two and other places how Mary kept these things in her heart. I'm like, oh, this is that quiet heart. This is that incorruptible beauty of a woman whose life is lived, not just on the surface, but there is a deep well of spirituality within her. And what I realize is that if a gentle and a quiet spirit is something that is beautiful and well-pleasing to God. It doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. God wants to cultivate that in each one of us. So for each one of us, God has us in a place of influence and we want our lives to be wildly influential for the best things in other people's lives. So I wanna pray that that would be the case for us. And I'm also gonna take some time to pray for those of us who wanna take that very first step in beginning our journey following Jesus. So let's pray together. Father, I wanna thank you for the gifts and talents that you have entrusted to each one of us. And Lord, will you let us be more and more influential in accordance with what you want from our lives and the lives of other people. Let us be great influences on people for your glory. 
And for those of us, Lord, who have never before said yes to Jesus, will you help us to take this next step? And so for those of you who are saying yes to Jesus for the first time, will you repeat this prayer after me? Say, Jesus, I give you my life. Thank you for saving me. I believe in you, your life, your death on the cross, and your resurrection. Forgive me of my sins and fill me with your Holy Spirit. And I ask it in Jesus' name. And we all agreed together and said, amen. For those of you who just said yes to Jesus, he has begun a good work that it's gonna take every single day for you to uncover all that it means. So I wanna help you take the next set of steps as well. So you pull out your mobile phone, text the word SAVE to 51400, and someone from my team will get back in touch with you so that we can help you take those next steps. But don't go anywhere. I got a little bit more to share with you, and I don't want you to miss it. You can take part in the amazing work God is doing through the powerful message that although life is messy, Jesus is real. By partnering with Daniel Fusco Ministries, you help make programs like this available to people who may not otherwise experience the love and hope only found in Jesus. With your regularly scheduled partnership, your generosity can help transform lives forever. Go to danielfusco.com partner now and become a part of the Daniel Fusco Ministry support team with your regularly scheduled or one-time gift. Be the hands and feet of Jesus in your world and become a partner today. So we are just about out of time on today's program, but I would love to connect with you. I love hearing about what God is doing in each one of your lives. So go to my website, danielfusco.com. Make sure you sign up for the mailing list, get you all the inside scoop on what's going on. Also, all the social media outlets, the two minute messages on Facebook and YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, and make sure you let me know what God's doing in your life because I love to hear about it. I would love for you to join me at Crossroads Community Church, one of our physical locations. You can find out more at crossroadschurch.net or on our internet campus. People all over the world are joining us online at crossroadslive.tv. I got books out that I'd love for you to get wherever you get books. My book, Upward, Inward, and Outward, Love God, Love Yourself, and Love Others, is essential reading, I believe, for all of us as we grow. Now listen, I have a big idea that I want to share with you that I don't want you to miss, and that's this. Just as moms are influential in our lives, well, God wants all of us to be influential and having a positive impact on people's lives. So make sure we make that great impact. God bless you guys. We'll see you soon. 